Hi, everyone. Uh, again, uh, thank you, Will and Rene, for those two great presentations. Um, you know, it's it, it helps a lot. Um, and um, um, for people that doesn't know me, I'm Yuri Carrillo. I'm a computational scientist uh, here at the uh, AMZO. And um, the last lecture today, we're going to cover the topic of data processing workflows for organic matter um, and also like lightly touch base about some data processing capabilities that uh, we developed for the metabolomics. Um, I don't want to repeat uh, everything that my colleagues <laughs> were, were talking before, uh, but it's just to uh, emphasize the complexity of the, the nature of the small molecules. Um, you know, it's different than the complexity that we often see on data um, from experiments of proteomics and genomics, where you have this linear combination of, uh, and, and you know exactly what the backbone of what those molecules should be. Um, when you're dealing with data for natural organic matter and metabolomics, um, there is a increased complexity of the different chemical motifs that you can um, analyze and also a high diverse um, types of, of chemical functionalities that are available there. So the strategies that are often used on genomics and proteomics um, are not feasible for the characterization of organic matter or uh, metabolites. So adding to that complexity, um, as Rene um, has you know, taught us this morning, um, there is this increased complexity of the different degradation pathways when the molecule or different biomass comes into contact with different environments. Um, so there is possible oxidation pathways, photodegradation pathways, thermodegradation, and also the interface with the different microorganisms that leads into the soil that increase the chemical complexity of the, the small molecule pool. Um, and one of the, the important facts that we need to understand is 80% uh, of our data, it's, it's too um, uncharacterized. We don't know where they are. We don't know what the, the structures are. Um, and it, it's really hard to get a clear and concise um, picture of all the molecular structures that we have on our data. So 80% of our data is to uh, our unknown. Um, so because of that increased complexity, um, we, you know, as Will taught us, um, there is multiple analytical techniques that are used to try to infer molecular structure or molecular identity. Um, so every analytical technique has its pros and cons. Um, you know, uh, we'll talk a lot about the FGCR. Um, there is the, uh, Rene touched base about the, the, the different type of analysis you can do on LCMS. Um, today, we're gonna focus on the data processing of the FGCR. Um, there is, as we will allude, there is, we cannot infer uh, molecular structure using FGCR. Um, but we can get a lot of um, molecular formal identification in a short period of time. Uh, a duty cycle is around like six seconds when, when you accumulate. So those experiments takes like one to six minutes. Um, so related to the question that we had before, what type of database? Um, when you're working with LCMS uh, or GCMS, what you're really trying to do is infer um, the molecular structure, and we often rely on the analysis of fragmentation patterns. So then we have database of fragmentation patterns that you can search and query against. On FGACR, uh, that is not possible, but we do have high mass accuracy. Um, and also different features that you can extract from the mass spec, like the finest apophic structure. Um, so as I said, we're gonna focus on FGACR and I'm gonna to try to give you a general idea of a workflow on how to treat the signal um, up to this point where we can get the molecular annotation output. Uh, tomorrow, uh, we're gonna to have a day that's gonna be 
specialize in talking about the visualization and statistical and downstream analysis. Um, so starting by the different data inputs. Um, sorry, should have turned this off. All right. So we, we, we have different type of data um, that, that's generated for different vendors and different mass spec types. Um, so the raw data that comes from the ICR is, uh, is, is often uh, generated as a time domain signal. Um, but we might encounter different data types coming from different instruments. Uh, for instance, Thermal um, has a, a, a pre-processing software that generates the mass spec and uh, that information is, is lost um, during that process. And you end up with a mass spectrum, uh, sometimes with all the data points, sometimes on the centroid mode after the, the peak picking process has been completed. Um, other times you might encounter that um, just what we call a mass list is, is pretty much like a, a table with the masses and abundances and other measurements like the resolving power and the signature noise. Um, so it's, it's really important then for us to realize that um, to be able to do a standardization on how we do the data processing, ideally you always want to start with the time um, um, domain data. Um, because then if, even if you have instruments, uh, data from different instruments, you, you, you can assure that the, even the signal processing is done is the, the same way across the different uh, instrument types. So Will um, shows us like the, the, this process of how to transform the time domain. So we use uh, Fourier transform. There's other steps that we might do. Um, so this is like a simplified version of this. There's an apodization, so you can apply a apodization function to enhance uh, the frequencies that are measured um, in the middle where, where those IOs are more stable after excitation. Um, there are processes that we can input uh, what we call zero filling uh, that will add more data points and increase the accuracy of the peak picking process. So after you go through all those processes, you do an FG to transform this time domain data to a frequency domain data. So this gives you the frequency of all the different ion clouds that you, you have inside the ICR. And then to transform that frequency to N over Z, we often do an external calibration. So you have um, a mix of molecules that you know what the masses are and what the frequency, and you can calculate what the frequency you're expecting to see. Um, so the most common use equation are the, the lead for equation. So you have two terms in the A and the B term um, that account for imperfections on the electrical field and the magnetic field into the ICR. So um, what we do is we externally um, calibrate and, and we, we, we find on A and B terms and that's often stored in the instrument. Um, and uh, then you can just transform your frequency to um, the different uh, mass spectrum. So from, from here, the next step after the, the generation of the, the M over Z is um, the definition of the noise. Um, so there's different ways uh, that you can infer what your baseline noise is. Um, so the most common way is manually inference. So uh, you go into the mass spec range and you find where you don't have any peaks, any clearest peaks. And then you just calculate the average of those lines. Um, so it's, it's a different approach um, that you can try to, um, to not have to manually do those, those type of, um, of inference is um, instead of calculating you, the, the baseline using all the data points, you can um, calculate what the minimum of those data points are. And that serves you to find where this baseline is. Uh, over here, you have an example of a protein mass spectrum um, that they are showing me here that sometimes you might even need to do a baseline correction just to make sure that you have a linear 
um, baseline. So then you just need one um, noise threshold across the whole spectrum. So after the, def the, the definition of the noise threshold, um, we go through uh, the algorithm to do the peak picking and the definition of where that peak starts and where that peak ends. Uh, that's often done by doing a first derivative um, and applying some parameters to tell uh, what is the limit that you, you uh, would accept where the, the cross point between the first derivative and your signal is. Um, so with that, you get the, uh, the, the centroid mode data. That's pretty much a table with all the inverses abundances um, on your mass spectrum. So the, um, the calculation of the minima is, is, is a really good way to automate the calculation of the noise threshold. Um, so one, another way of, of calculating, the, the problem with that is that if you, if you let the minima to extrapolate far away from where your signal is, you might end up with uh, a baseline that's offset a little bit higher than you want it. Uh, so one of the, the other ways to try to automate this is uh, when you have those uh, data from organic matter where you do expect to have this mass distribution um, where the most of your signal is going to be, you can just try to calculate the number average m over z that will give you like a, uh, a point like in the middle of the distribution. And then you have a range of m over z where you can allow the algorithm to try to find the minimal data points. Uh, so that's why like just an expansion here showing you that by using this approach, you can uh, clearly see by the red that the base uh, noise line is, is well defined by this method. So the second thing um, that is, is done is um, you have your baseline but that's not where your, your noise threshold is. Um, there is no statistic, statistical significance here. Uh, the, there is different levels uh, that um, on how to calculate. So the, the threshold is calculated as the baseline plus uh, X times the, the standard deviation of the, the, those data points. Um, the community uh, often said that as really like a, a conservative threshold of six uh, standard deviation, making sure so that you can see the yellow line, there is no possibility of having any noise. However, um, the analysis of the ideal threshold needs to be done and evaluated instrument by instrument. Um, so it really depends on the cell that you're using and uh, the magnetic field strength and also, you know, how many um, transients you're, how many signal you're, you're summing in, in letting you acquire it. Um, then when you evaluate that, you lock that to the instrument um, and, and then it should be good to go. Um, so the next step after the signal processing, the noise is evaluated. Uh, what we often do is a recalibration of that, that mass spectrum. Uh, and the reason for it is that what you see over here is a common air distribution. So over here on the x-axis is uh, the mass air. Um, oh, sorry. The over here in the, the y-axis is the mass air, and over here is the m over z. So you, you can see that with the the external calibration only, you still have a high systematic change on the air distribution, and we really want to get this air flat across the m over z range. Um, so the only way to, to achieve such a flat distribution like this is, is to go through an internal calibration process. Um, so uh, the most common, commonly done approach is to uh, find homologous series of peaks that you, you, you have some understand, pre-understanding of what they, they should be. Um, and they need you use all those data points. Um, and the more data points you have, the better the, 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 your recalibration is going to be. Um, over here, I'm showing an example. Like this plot over here is from um, a strategy that's called step fit, is you segment the mass spec every 
uh, 14 m over z units. And for every 14 m over z units, you have one calibration equation uh, using the lead four equation. Um, so then you can see that you end up with a really flat um, uh, calibration curve uh, that is centered around the zero over here. Um, that facilitates uh, the molecular search algorithm because when you, although like the mass accuracy is pretty good, you can see over here is around 0 0.2 ppm. Um, the, the range that we would need to, to allow the software to search for because you still have the systematic error across the mover Z would be around 0 0.2. After the calibration, we can decrease that to around 0 0.1 uh, because then you remove the systematic error. Or the other option would be to segment the original um, data and then change the range of uh, mass error that you allow for the molecular uh, formula algorithm just to, be, uh, to search against. Um, so after we have the, the signal um, process uh, complete, the next step is, is to perform um, molecular formula search. Um, so the reason why we can infer uh, molecular formula using mass accuracy is because again, is one thing that we call mass defect. Um, every atom has a unique mass defect. Um, so when you look at the mass of an atom um, and you look at the sum of the individual particles, you realize that the masses are not the same. Um, this is what we call this difference between that and the, the real mass of the atom is what we call the mass G effect. Um, and the reason for that difference is because there is what we call a binding energy um, that's necessary to put all those particles together. And it's, it's really high energy. So um, you end up with those different masses on the atom uh, to account for this energy needed to put those particles together. Um, and because the different atoms have different number of particles, that energy is different. So the, the amount of mass is also different. Uh, this discrepancy of mass is different for the different atoms. So when you look at the, um, the combination of those atoms, where right, because the molecular formula is nothing more than a combination of all those atoms, um, ideally, if you have infinite uh, mass accuracy, every molecular formula uh, has a unique mass defect. Um, and over here, what we find by the, the mass defect of the molecular formula is the difference between the nominal mass minus the, the um, accurate mass of the molecular formula. So of course, we don't have ideal um, uh, infinite mass accuracy, right? So every instrument it, it, it has limitations on how much mass accuracy you can get. Uh, but it, it depends on the system, it depends on, on the pool of organic matter um, that you're trying to analyze. Uh, sometimes a, an unambiguous molecular formula assignment is possible uh, by only doing the mass accuracy, um, but only in the specific regions of the mass spec. And it's also dependent on the complexity of the sample and how good um, your instrument is in resolving that matrix. So it, it, it varies a lot. Um, the, however, when you have um, systems with higher complexity and different ion types, um, that, that, that assumption of an unambiguous molecular formula, it's most of the time not valid. Uh, it, it complicates when you're, you're trying to add metals and, uh, to do meter analysis um, and allogenated compounds into the mix. Um, so when we're building the, the, those combination of atoms, right? Um, we, you can see that when you increase the number of atoms, the number of possible molecular formulas also increase. 
Um, and the, the increase of possible molecular formulas also increase with the mass. So that's what you're seeing over here. Um, the plot A is only when you allow carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen uh, with the peaks above uh, signature noise of 20. Um, and then you, um, when you start adding like a one nitrogen and you can see that the number of uh, possible candidates go up. Uh, and then when you start adding ph phosphorus, uh, nitrogen and sulfur, and you can see that there is a, this exponential growth of number of possible molecular formula um, that can be inferred by using mass accuracy only. Um, so there is this dependency on the refusalving power as well. Uh, and there is also, um, and I think was one of the great points that we were trying to, to make is um, one feature that you see on the mass spec uh, relates to one um, molecular formula. That molecular formula can have multiple isomers. But because sometimes you don't have enough resolving power on those systems, you might end up with one feature, one mass spec peak with two possible molecular forms, two distinct molecular forms. Um, and you know, you saw the, the, the air distribution that I showed um, that we can remove the systematic air, but the random air, uh, it's, it's not removed. Um, and you still have that dependencies with mass. So the higher the mass, because the frequency is lower, the dispersion of the air is bigger. Um, so what that translates to us is that with the higher masses, we have more candidates, but you also need to allow a higher range of search. Um, so the confidence of those assignments are really, really uh, complicated. Uh, There's some strategies that people try to use here on trying to do the Kendrick analysis. Um, this is one of the reasons why the Kendrick fails across a wide M over Z range. Um, so moving on, um, so when we generate those combination of atoms, um, you know, uh, it, it's not just pure combinatorial analysis. Uh, you get hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen, and you just put all those things together. Uh, we, we try to follow some chemical rules. Um, and um, there, there is like, you know, a clear example is the Leo's rule. So you're trying to make sure that the octopate is, is, is rule is followed. Um, but I just wanna note that the way that we generate this database, they're always based on the neutral form. So we're really regenerating the molecular formula for the molecules, not for the ions. Um, and the reason for this is because one, um, if your database is gonna be smaller. Two, it allows you to, on the runtime, when you're actually doing the data processing, to add the different types that, ion types that that molecule might generate during the ionization process, like a protonation or a radical cation or um, adduct ion or, or, or what so. Um, but we, we follow some chemical rules, um, but the problem with the data processing of high resolution mass spec is that we still have a lot of heuristic rules that we need to follow um, to try to decrease the unambiguous, uh, the ambiguity of the molecule, the possible ambiguity of the molecular form assignment. Uh, one that uh, we often do is we limit what the, the search space, um, what the, the amount of atoms you're gonna allow to be searched. And that inference is important um, because um, this is often done by the person that it's, um, has some knowledge about the experimental design, but also how the sample is processed and how the sample is being analyzed on the mass spec. Uh, so those are all assumptions that are done by one operator only. Um, we also use some limits of the HC ratio. Um, and there is also, um, inference in terms of what the molecules you do expect in the negative electric sprays. So you do expect to see a lot of carboxylic acids. So you, you would allow mole you know, molecular formula that has uh, carbon and hydrogen and two oxygens, right? So that's what we call like the O2 class. 
Um, but there is different ways to choosing molecular formula when you have an, an, an big, uh, more than one option there. Uh, and those, those different strategies often rely on choosing the lowest air or choosing the lowest number of head atom that might make sense chemically for the system you're analyzing, but it might hinder it, um, the discovery of new possible molecular formula that you, 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 we wouldn't see before. Um, so those are like, you know, the balance of how you're, you're making your assumptions on, on the molecular formula side. Um, so another strategy that um, that's often used uh, is to use homologous series that you do see uh, on organic matter um, to extrapolate the molecular form assignment. So lowest uh, masses or M over Z will have a low probability of duplicate molecular formula candidates. And then if you look into those patterns, you, you realize that those differences of 14, uh, it, they, they are differences related to Michelinic units. So is a difference of one carbon into hydrogen, right? So you just keep adding it. So if you can find on the lower M over Z range, um, uh, a molecular formula assignment that only have one option, then you can try to extrapolate that further um, only by adding CA2 or A2, and sometimes you can use that uh, by using CO or CHO uh, series. But as I showed you before, you know, with the increase of the, the, the masses, there is also the increase of dispersion of the air. So the extrapolation will fail when you get to the higher masses. So that is a problem uh, that's still unsolved today. Um, so the, the molecular formula assignment um, on high resolution are the primary feature that we use for, for the, the uh, molecular formula assignment is the ability of having a high mass accuracy uh, measurement of the ions the, on the mass spec. But there is also the finest topic structure um, um, that we can try to infer. Um, so we already talked about this a little bit. Um, you know, most elements, they occur in nature as a mixture of isotopes. Um, and the, those, those different isotopes have defined probabilities of finding them in nature, right? So um, the, the, here we have like a table of the most common um, other atoms that we use. Um, I add the bromine to, because I'm going to give you an example on the next slide. Um, but the, what we call the monisotopic mass um, is the sum of the elements with the most abundant isotope. So when you're talking about monisotopic mass is we're, we're only calculating the sum of the, the masses of the carbon-12, the, the nitrogen-14, or the oxygen-16 on this case. Um, so here is an example of... Um, you know, uh, uh, a standard compound is a bromothiol blue, is a pH indicator. Um, so what we've done is we were testing the software uh, abilities to predict the, the finest atomic structure for, for this molecule. So um, using like a full scan analysis, meaning that we have a broad band um, uh, frequency being captured on the mass by on the FGICR. Um, we did the analysis and you can see like the, the black dots over here is the um, uh, experimental value uh, of the abundance that you should expect to see the different isotopologues. And the, um, the red uh, over here is what the predicted um, abundance should be for, for that species. So you, you can clearly see that um, the measurement of the magnitude that translates to the abundances of those peaks on the ICR, even when you have a pure signal, it's not um, perfect. Um, so the accuracy on the measurement of the magnitudes on the ICR is, is still a, a problem. Um, on, so the reliance on the measurement of the abundances are, are not um, perfect. So 
that goes away, right? If, if you isolate and if you just, instead of trying to do this broad band analysis, you only do a short range of MFRC. So the accuracy of the measurement of the magnitudes because you decrease different ion, ion interactions and, and, and um, other factors. Um, so that this accuracy goes up. Um, so when we are trying to do the molecular formula assignment, uh, the, the strategy that we use is we, we search first for the monoisotopic um, species. So when we are, we're, we're gathering the information from the database, the database does not generate the isotope logs. We only start the monoisotopic on the database. So we search against that. And then after we search the, the monoisotopic, if we have a possible monoisotopic hit in range, then we predict what the isotope log should be for the carbon oxygen based on whatever the molecular formula is. Uh, and then we are gonna go back to the mass spectrum and search against the, the mass spectrum. So over here you have in blue, um, an example of a mass spectrum with all the monoisotopic assigned with you know, different heta atoms over here. Um, and over here, all the isotopologues we have th that has one carbon 13. So the point here is um, you do see most of those isotopologues, but there is a dependency on the signal to noise of the peak, because if this, the, the abundance of the peak is not high enough, you might end up losing that, that signal. But in looking at the pattern of the whole, you can see that you can get most of them. Um, on the right side over here, you do see the um, um, uh, air analysis of the difference of the air analysis of the, the measurement abundance for one carbon 13, two carbon 13, and three carbon 13. So you can see that this is a high uh, air range. So the, there is no way you can rely on the accuracy of the abundances. Um, so what we often do is we discourage the use of isotope pattern filters. Do not filter the, 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 the molecular formula assignments based on isotopologues only. So um, the, there's a bunch of assumptions that we need to do, right? Um, in, in how to get the data process and um, there's assumptions on the signal processing. There's assumption of the search space. Um, this is how we do the data processing today on most of the academia, right? So we have an instrument and we're gonna put the data somewhere and we have a person that knows exactly what happened with the sample, what the, the experimental design is. Um, and we have multiple softwares, right? So we have, uh, uh, the software from the vendors that will do the signal processing for you most of the time. Um, and we have different software that, that does the molecular from assignment. Um, but this is really like inefficient way of, of working with the, the data processing pipelines. And also um, it, it's really hard to to go beyond this paradigm of having a standalone software and having to rely on an operator that understand the system to uh, make the right assumptions on how to process the data. So what we have been working on here in EMSO is the development of a new platform that we call Core MS. That's the, the fundamental piece that we, we, we want to start moving the, the research community to a new paradigm um, where we have the possibility of the standardization of the signal processing, but also the standardization of the molecular formula and trying to get away from that paradigm of having to choose a molecular formula. So, um, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go really fast right now. Um, on, but the core MS pretty much uh, is standardized this by creating this hierarchical restructure of different mass spec uh, types. Um, 
and you have different workflows. Uh, so then you standardize the data parsing, the data signal processing, and also the molecular annotation workflows. Um, the other thing that we, we discuss is like those molecular formula um, database, they're often created uh, in a static mode. Uh, so what we've done on the core mass is we have this dynamic um, creation of the, the possible molecular formula assignments, um, oh, molecular formula candidates. So when you import the mass spectrum into the query mass, uh, it will use, it will do a calculation of all the possible nominal masses, and then we generate only the possibilities for formulas that has that nominal mass. Um, and it communicate back and forth with the database to see if entries for that search space that you're, you're uh, requesting already exist or not. If it doesn't, it will add those uh, new molecular formula there. Uh, it automatically calculates the final isotopic structure at the runtime. Um, and it follows this uh, general uh, principle of the molecular formula assignment that I said before is like you've, you've searched for the monisotopic. If you find the monisotopic, you go back and calculate the final isotopic structure. And then with the, the molecular formula structure, you go back to the mass spec and then you see if there is anything in range. But instead of choosing which option it is, what we are doing is we're calculating a confidence score for all the possibilities. And the reason for this is, again, going to the point that even uh, in some systems, you might have one M over Z, you might have multiple uh, molecular formula that are possible, that are true. So um, this confidence score is, is based on those two main features that we can uh, get from the mass spec. So uh, we have this assumption that the mass error is, uh, is a normal distribution. Um, so we use this first term over here to um, use as the mass accuracy term and the spectral similarity term. Uh, the spectral similarity term is between the uh, the predicted isotopologue um, distribution and the observed isotopologue distribution. So the better your, your data gets, the better your instrument is in actually measuring the magnitude, the better, uh, the more confident you have that um, the that, that, that molecular formula is possible. Um, so, we use the same framework for not only the FGSCR, but also for the LCMS. So we have one statistical framework across the different uh, analytical platforms. Um, so over here, you have an example of an LCMS metabolomics with its multiple uh, molecular standards um, that you know the software does the inference of the molecular formula. Uh, and it gives you a confidence score, but it also goes into the fragmentation pattern and try to infer what the different neutral losses are based on that molecular formula for you. Um, we also have developed the GCMS and we use similar uh, spectral similarity uh, oats, uh, and confidence score for, for the GCMS. Um, so on the core MS, we also have uh, the the portal, uh, it's, a, it's a graphic interface solution um, that it helps you orchestrate and um, having a web application on, that you can just go on the GitHub and put on your own institution. So uh, you can process the data using the graphic interface and we're gonna be teaching the students um, how to use this and also how to use the different code for the core MS. Um, so there are, the, the core mass is available, uh, publicly available. On, and here are some links for, for the framework. Uh, there are different level of access that, that you can have. So if you really wanna work on the code level, you can go to the, the framework, the base framework. Um, if there is multiple CLIs is like a, as, a, as a wrapper on, on the different workflows that we have done for the uh, organic matter that we call EnviroMass and also for the MetaMS, um, that's for the GCMS base. And if you wanna use the graphic interface, we have the core MS portal right there. Um, so 
thank you so much for, for listening to me for this past 40 minutes. Uh, I have some acknowledgements here on some colleagues uh, that, that you know, helped us on the development of the software and for our funding engine. And um, with that, I'll just take some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Yuri. Uh, that was really, really interesting uh, overview of some of the different strategies that are going on. Um, as, as you said, we still got time for a few questions. If people want to post some of those in the Discord or in the chat here. Um, I'm not seeing any right now. Uh, so I'm going to throw you a couple of softball questions uh, to start you off. Um, there's a lot of pr data processing steps, all of that signal processing, um, you know, peak picking, um, appetization, everything through to getting a mass spectrum. Is all of that solved or is there research that still needs to be done to improve any of those aspects? So in terms of apologization and, and zero filling, I think that's is really well established, right? Um, in terms of uh, how to better, uh, what the region of the, the, the transient you need to emphasize, right? Because that's what you're trying to do when you do apologization. Of course, you kind of change the cell, you're going to have to change how uh, the different apologization uh, strategies you're going to use. But I would say that um, one of the, the, the fields that we, that we still need a lot of research is about the phasing, right? So the one thing I didn't touch about was that when you do the FG, um, there's two ways you can do the, the, the FG to get the frequency domain uh, is the magnitude in the, in the absorption mode. So the calculation of the different phases of uh, the transient, it's something that uh, is unsolved. There is no analytical solution for, for that problem yet. Um, and I think that's, that will be something that will be useful uh, in help the standardization of the signal processing across the different uh, instrument types. Cool, thank you. Um, I guess related to that, uh, your confidence score, um, is there further that that can go? Right now it only takes in a couple of uh, spectrum variables. Is there more information that you could feed into that model or the plans to incorporate machine learning? Or is it the confidence score is sort of as far as you can go? Um, so there is definitely more uh, features that you could add, right? So the, the idea of having a common framework uh, for doing the confidence analysis on different instruments, like for the FGACR, I think that we covered pretty well with the mass accuracy and the finance topic structure. But the when you when you start to using like high resolution LCMS with fragmentation studies, then you can start to use the um, the calculation of the spectral similarity of the fragmentation patterns and add to that equation. Um, for direct infusion and high resolution, I think that those two variables will cover, I hope, <laughs> pretty much what we need. Okay, thank you. Um, it looks like some people are typing but haven't finished yet. Um, oh, here we go. Um, we have a question from Chang in, in Discord asking different data processing workflows might come up with different results. And there are always some false positive features generated when processing. What are your thoughts on this and how can it be done better with your tools like QuoraMass? That's a great question. So, <laughs> um, the, you know, like the, this idea of, of having, um, one of the things I was trying to, to say during the talk was about the, the necessity of having an operator to, to define what the search space is, right? Um, the one problems that we have is that, you know, there is never an absolute answer to what is an ideal search space. Because when you have um, the necessity of changing the search space and how many atoms or how many molecular formula you're going to allow your search space to be, that will also change, you know, the, um, uh, the, the probability of having false positives. So it's, it's still an unanswered question on my view that there is, there is a lot of research that still needs to be done to be able to get us to confidently assign a search space based on, an, on, on the sample type and uh, the sample preparation type. So uh, there's a lot of work that we still need to be done to, to allow us to have a framework to calculate 
confidently calculate false positives right now, right? Because otherwise you end up with calculating false positive on that database or on that search space only, but that's not broadly applicable on my field. Cool. Thank you for that, Yuri. Um, we have another question from John B asking, if you have FTICR data from different instruments, i.e. two different field strengths, the seven Tesla and the 21 Tesla, is it possible to use some of the math you described today to correct for the different resolutions and directly compare the data? I.e. could you make a 21 spectrum, 21 T spectrum look like a seven T spectrum from the same compound or vice versa in complex soils? You can, if, <laughs> um, you know, like the, um, you, you can truncate the transient Right, and then what you do is, um, because if you wanna make the data comparable, you're gonna have to give up some resolving power of the, of the data. So like if you compare it to 21 versus the 12 G or you compare it to 21 versus the, the 7 G, you're gonna have to make this, the, the, the higher resolving power data be compatible, be lower. So and the only way to do that is by uh, truncating the data. So instead of using the whole transient um, to do the FG, you just cut that to a point that you have comparable resolution. Um, then it covers the resolution. The problem now of the abundance is even more complicated because uh, Will was, was showing us we have this um, transfer time, like the time flight, right? And when you have different machines with different um, magnetic field strengths, so there's also uh, the loss of the, the ion package through that transfer is higher on, on the 21G than this on the 7G. So that kind of doesn't answer the question, but um, <laughs> that's, that's the thing that you're gonna have to do with um, if you're trying to find a compromise there. Yeah, I think, I think that's the critical point is that you can make the peaks broader, but you can't compensate for fundamental instrument differences. Um, something, uh, something that we didn't really get into is that we have four or five different ICR instruments in EMSL and they're all different. They all have different generations of cell or different hardware. And so it's very tricky uh, to make these comparisons. Um, I think there's time for one more question or two more questions. I'm not seeing any more though. So I'm gonna ask you another question. And like give people another 30 seconds to type something. Um, you talked a little bit about LCMS data processing and core MS is obviously used for the complex mixture workflows. Can core MS handle LC FTICR data with complex mixtures? Yes. Um, the, the whole idea of having the, the data structure follow this mass spec um, hierarchical structure is that the the changes needed to do the LCMS data processing for full scan analysis uh, is it's, it's trivial on, 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 the, on the framework. Um, because you have an LCMS object that will have a bunch of mass spectrum objects and they're interrelated through the, the code side. Um, so it adds like a loop into the code, like two lines of code in the grid go. Excellent. Um, I don't see anything else coming in. So I think in that interest, uh, maybe we wrap up. Wrap up. Um, thank you, Yuri, and thank you, Renee, for your talk this morning.